Opening day, technically, is here. I mean, the Dodgers and Padres are playing baseball. Christian Scott made an appearance against the Marlins and looked fucking sick. Tyler McGill is the number five starter. And just a little bit of housekeeping in the Mets world. All that on the next episode of the Mets Up Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Aura. Are you tired of receiving spam phone calls to the point where you don't even want to answer your phone anymore? That's because data brokers sell your information to scammers and spammers and anybody else who may want to target you. That's right, your full name, your home address, your health records, it's all out there. That's why we've been using Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does this stop scammers and hackers from getting and using your information, but it also protects you from them using that information to get into your social media accounts or bank accounts too. Aura is always on duty, looking to keep you safe so you can focus on anything else you need to focus on with peace of mind. So stop data brokers from exposing your personal information to that and visit our sponsor at aura.com backslash metstup. That's aura.com backslash Mets up to get a 14 day free trial and see how much of your data is being sold. We value privacy here in the Mets Up podcast, and there's no better way to ensure your safety online than by using Aura. Thank you, Aura, for sponsoring today's episode. What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up podcast. We have some smaller things to talk about today, but as you know, this is a pro Christian Scott podcast, and he just pitched against the Marlins and was phenomenal, was incredible. It was on TV. We got the stack cast numbers. We can see everything. He was going up against the Marlins Major League roster, essentially, as well. And I don't know if it really could have gone any better than it did, and especially watching him live and with, like, good cameras and, and HD quality. Guy's disgusting. So me and James are going to talk about him, Tyler McGill, as well as what the ending roster might look like before we get going into opening day. Before we do get going into any of that, make sure you guys follow us on all our social media at Metsed Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the Metsed Up Podcast YouTube channel if you have not yet done so. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe. Remember, if you want an easy shout out on the podcast, drop us a good review and we'll read it out at the end of an episode. So James... What are we thinking about, Christian? Scott, how are you feeling? Fucking awesome. Just a great day in general. You said at the top of the show, but baseball was back. Setting at a 6 a.m. alarm and then falling asleep in the first inning felt so amazing with uh, you, Darvish, <laughs> and, on my computer in my bed. But just being able to watch baseball ease into the day and then have this fantastic Christian Scott start like in the middle of the afternoon. It's been it's been a wonderful day of baseball. And Scott, just anyone who watched it, Twitter was ablaze. National media started picking him up. It was just he was completely fucking lights out. It was sensational. Skip Schumacher was doing some media availability with the Marlins uh, broadcast team, and he was like, I'm really happy to get this guy Scott out of the game. You know who came in after Scott? <laughs> Edwin Diaz. And he was like, I yeah. can't wait to get this guy out. But it was just, it was, it was, it was full dominance. Every Everyone was on board. And Marlins announcers are like, this Christian Scott has a lot of zip on that fastball. It was just, he couldn't be stopped. Yeah, the fastball looked great. The sweeper, or is it sweeper, slider? What is it exactly? He's got one of each. He has a sweeper and a slider. Oh, the sweeper is the new one. The well, whatever one, one he threw to Trey yeah. Mancini was that disgusting. Was it was absolutely filthy. It moved like I was on the phone with my dad. I was on a little bit uh, ahead of him while we were watching, and I saw a picture. Went, oh my god! And then he's on the phone. Ten seconds later, he goes, "Oh my god!" And I was like, "Yeah, that sweeper was uh, nasty." I'm I'm ready to make some like crazy statements about Christian Scott, but I'll, I'll let you get into the numbers first. I mean, we should be making crazy statements. I feel a little bad because everyone on Twitter today was comparing him to Wheeler, and I think we started that because he just kind of looks yeah. like him a little bit, and the, the the arm slot is very similar, like we said like when he had his first start against the Marlins a few weeks ago, but I don't know. Like I don't want to compare anybody to Zach Wheeler because Zach Wheeler is one of the best young pitchers the Mets have developed in the last two decades and one of the best pitchers we've, we've seen in our lives in Major League Baseball. He has some of the best playoff stats literally ever in the history of baseball, but it all looks like baby Wheeler. And just today, mixing the the fastball with the sinker, mixing the gyro slider with the sweeper, showing a changeup with it, seven strikeouts in four innings, no walks, with no walks, also zero three ball counts. And he only threw, I think, four pitches with two ball counts the whole game. And it's just like, that is what Christian Scott is. It's overpowering stuff. He's filling up the strike zone. He's not. He's just not going to let you get on base for free. He's ahead of every hitter. Fastballs, fastballs, fastballs. The first inning was only fastballs. And it was just against lefties, too. And he was throwing more of his two-seamer today than the four-seamer. So that two-seamer was cutting back, like, front-dooring on the lefties. They just couldn't really get a grasp on it. He had a called strike to, um, I think, Vidal Brujan, the first step out of the game. Brujan, like, picked his head up and like, looked around, blinked. He was like, oh, I was not... I was not prepared for that. And it was just it was just a very advanced feel too with this amazing stuff and filling up the strike zone. He worked inside to both sides of the plate with two seamer and four seamer, which it's a hard thing to do for a pitcher at any level, especially a pitcher who's never pitched in the major leagues before. Coming, especially a guy who's on the righty who has fastballs that run in both directions, being able to work inside to righties and lefties. Like that is that's an advanced pitching method right there. 
He mixed both his sliders to the righties, to the lefties, he overpowered the fastballs. Changeup didn't have much feel for it today, but really just didn't matter because everything was lights out. Yeah, he uh, he's a future ace. I mean, there's I think there's just no way around it. The way that he looked, and again, it's spring trading, take everything with a grain of salt, but the stuff that he showed in this game, you just don't really find too often. There's not many guys that have that kind of stuff, and the way that he was attacking hitters, the way that you've spoke about it so many times on this podcast, like he doesn't get behind in counts. Like he's just so aggressive. It gives you all those makings of what become aces in major league baseball. It's very, very hard to be a guy that walks a lot of guys gets behind in counts. doesn't have that nasty stuff and still be so good, which is why sometimes maybe when you see me and James rank pitchers and you go, Oh, why is Shane Bieber not on there? Well, Shane Bieber's not really that good because he doesn't have this stuff like this anymore. Like he used to, but then you see a guy like Christian Scott and you go, holy shit, like as long as the development path continues, because there's still more that we have to get out of Christian Scott for him to ever reach that crazy high potential that I'm talking about. But for him to continue on that development path, something that he adjusted to so quickly last year, as we know, and you've spoke about before with uh, Eric Yeager's working and tweaking and adding pitches. I mean, the sky is the limit with this kid. He's ridiculously exciting. Especially because we've seen him get so good now so quickly. Like, I think that's like a big thing in sports, baseball in general, where it's like when you see improvement, that leads you to believe that there's more improvement coming next. And that is like, you can see that hard and fast with Christian Scott in his sweeper. That was the pitch that was going super viral today. Pitching Ninja tweeted out, Major League Baseball main account tweeted out. I want to shout out Alex Fast because he was liking my tweets. I was screen recording Christian Scott on Stream East and then putting them on Twitter and he was liking them. And nice. then MLB main. Then suddenly puts a Christian Scott clip up. I'm like, okay, hell yeah. But again, the two nasty whiffs on Trey Mancini and John Birdie, the rat, that went crazy viral. And they were both, they were both just looked utterly out of out of place. They looked like not major league baseball players. And each of these guys had legitimate major league careers against this Christian Scott sweeper. And the pitch was sitting 84, 85, which would have been top 20 in velocity for an average sweeper last year in the major leagues. He was sitting between like 45 and 50 inches of average movement on it, plus drop and both plus drop and sweep, moving in both directions, better than major league average. It was just him breaking off that pitch. It was like, and he just learned this pitch last year, allegedly. And it's also funny, Tim Healy tweeted, we talked about it before, that his original slider that Christian Scott has, his gyro slider, he learned from Max Scherzer, from Pitching Ninja. So this is someone who has an ability to keep adding pitches and learning things. The sliders both look amazing. He's throwing two different kinds of fastballs, which is something else that I want to talk about because his fastballs on the GOAT TJ stats, the spring training stuff plus God, didn't grade out super well because Savant said they were all sinkers. But just watching them, some of them didn't move like two seamers or sinkers, whatever he's throwing. So I think probably four of them are misguided as fastballs. But even with that, they're still 96, 97, 95. So they're still, and they got tons of whiffs. So like that is more important than stuff plus grades. When you're seeing seven whiffs on 14 swings or whatever it was, something like that, that's going to be more important than a stuff grade just because that's what the results are. But every everything he's doing, pitchability, advanced feel, the velocity, staying ahead in the counts. It's it's all the stuff of the future race. Yeah. And what's crazy is and just like talking from the the content world now too, even like I don't I don't know if he's gonna make top one hundred lists because he's not on it right now. For there are a couple he's on. But like pipeline. Let's just say the biggest one pipeline. Pipeline. I don't think he's on baseball America either, to be fair. I, I think he's not on that one yet. Um but let's just say pipeline in general. He's going to get called up this year. He's going to throw innings, and he's not going to be able to ever actually get on that list because he's going to lose his rookie status. Do you think that there's anything to him throwing four innings to that makes you think this call-up could be a little bit closer than we think? Yes, even just the fact that he is still in Major League Camp right now. And I think same with Mike Vassell. They're some of the last guys to get the call down. I thought it was also interesting this happens on the same day that Tyler McGill gets announced as the five-starter because Jose Budo is also dominating in camp, and Joey Lucchese has the veteran experience. So realistically... Even if Christian Scott is ahead of Mike Vassell, which he might not even be because he hasn't touched AAA yet. Like he's at best SP8, if not SP9, and also not on the 40 man roster. So, so many things technically have to happen for him to go, but you can't really watch Christian Scott and not think he's one of the five best pitchers the Mets have on the, in the entire organization right now. And it's apparent. No one else in the Mets system can throw sliders like this consistently. No one can throw fastballs like this consistently. No one can throw strikes like this almost consistently, which is a funny thing to say, but I feel like there's going to be some moments where we're watching Adrian Hauser struggle in mid-April be like, <laughs> where the fuck is Christian Scott? But it's just, just, this is the kind of bullshit with organizational politics, 40-man roster stuff, a little bit of service time manipulation, which is funny about it too, because he's I think Scott's already either 24 or just turned 25. So with the six-year service time window, we suddenly have him 
for his entire pitching, not his entire prime, because pitchers hit their prime later. But we're going to have him for his entire part of his career that he has peak velocity. It's kind of a situation where since it took him so long to develop because he came from reliever and because he came from college, we've almost now sunctured up this entire beautiful part of his career where he looks like it's almost can't miss at this point. This is just going to be kind of crazy, but he is low key where he went to high school, Cavalry Christian. I knew it was uh, sounded familiar uh, out in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, Andrew Painter was the, oh. at that school as well. This is low key a pitching lab school, by the way. Nice. So in terms of guys just recently in the majors, you have Andrew Painter, Christian Scott, and then you have Jake Eater, who again say what you want about him, but he's a major league pitcher. That's pretty yeah. insane. Luke Jackson, aka Puke Jackson, also pitched there. And they have Irv Carter, who's a young, uh, exciting prospect in the Blue Jays organization, who's also got crazy stuff. So I'm like, damn, a little bit of a pitching factory down there in Cavalry Christian. And to answer your question, he is 24, turning 25 in June, the middle of June, June 15th. Yeah, okay, so that's it. Also, like June 15th is also a funny day for his birthday because that feels like when the call up could become real. It almost has but to like, be. Like, maybe, but maybe it's earlier because I don't like, here's the thing, and I know. I'm going to be the one who's going to be like a little bit uh, exaggerating in today's podcast and just getting people excited about probably nothing. But you don't really see guys stay in camp this long if there isn't a thought that you're going to be up pretty soon. Like four innings today yeah. on March 20th when the season is a week away. There, I'm not saying he's going to be opening day. That's not happening. I throw that out the window. But like May 1st, let's say so, someone's nicked up, someone's bruised. Maybe, maybe Adrian Hauser stinks. Whatever it's going to be. Like, I think there's a world where Christian Scott could be up here as soon as May 1st. The key is the 40-man spot. That's the thing holding him back right now. There almost has yeah. to be someone who winds up on the 6 day IL in this pitching staff for him to get that spot and him well, to get the be. call. I mean, there's a lot of it guys that could be, be of IL. No, because 60-man opens up a free 40-man spot. You still have to knock someone off the 40-man hmm. if there's only a 10-day IL spot. That That's the key right now. Oh, and again, really? I thought, okay. Yeah, we. I mean, we still have Luis Severino. We're really excited about Severino, but we've known yeah. in the past. He, he he had a quote the other day about how good he felt coming through camp. That was the first time since 2018 he's going to get through <laughs> camp completely healthy. So that's like... Oh, Mojo, you know, so it, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mojo. Mark, Mark's dog was sitting this week, people who weren't watching the stream last Friday. But uh, Jose Quintana had a tumor last year. I know where he missed half the year. He was on a 6 day yeah. for what we thought it was for no reason. And also, Quintana and Severino, depending on how the season goes, are suddenly trade pieces too for the Mets. So that's why like the worst yeah. case scenario for Christian Scott, it's going to be the beginning of August. And that is kind of, if we think back, it's been a long time. I understand Mets fans. That was when you saw Harvey come up for the first time. I think that was when you saw Syndergaard come for the first time. And he's like, not, Wheeler, I think was earlier in the season. He had a bit of a weirder path, but it's, that's kind of when you see these prospects start to come. And again, I think right now there's no question. He's one of the five or six best starting pitchers in the Mets organization. I, he might even be two or three you could probably you could probably sell me on one if you if you catch me after a few drinks but it's just the the way all this bullshit works and we know it's just that you want to get the extra year you want to manipulate the time and we're just not an organization right now who probably has enough pitching depth that we're just going to be they're going to start cutting pitchers willy-nilly like they're gonna they're gonna burn grant hartwick down to the bone before they wind up cutting him <laughs> like you're you're gonna try to squeeze every last ounce of phil bickford's arm before you release him like that's just what these Joey's Lucas Lucas teams do <laughs> yeah joe lucay is getting innings right now guys like he's he's a veteran that's just that's just how it works like you don't just you don't just get rid of assets for nothing and it's stupid because he is one of the five best but you're just you're just not gonna see him again stupid but that sadly is how it fucking works Okay, so before or after he turns 25, June 15th, will he be up or down? Slightly after. I think July 1st is my okay. day. That's my Christian Scott okay, day. Big right. circle on it. I'm, take, I'm and, taking the under. I'm taking before. All right, should you do a messed up bet? Over under July 1st? Yeah, well, uh, yeah over under July 1st. I don't know. It, let's do a beer at the game. And then whatever next game <laughs> that he got. Well, we're going to be at his debut, so whatever yeah, his I'm debut is, the, his person home debut, the other person yeah. appear. All right, that's yeah. an easy one. I'll take it. Because also, again, it is funny that this is all happening. This start happens like an hour after Mendoza officially announces Tyler McGill as the fifth starter. And McGill, like for all intents and purposes, has earned being the fifth star of the sprint. Like, there's no doubt about yes. it. A lot of people listening, Mark and I saying, we've all, we, everyone's been hurt by Tyler McGill before. We've watched Tyler McGill be good. We've watched Tyler McGill be bad. We've watched Tyler McGill be healthy. We've watched Tyler McGill get hurt. That's what happens every day Tyler McGill. Some combination of those four things, and it goes. But, I don't know, 3-5 ERA, 1-0 whip. 16 strikeouts and four walks, 16 spring innings. Like, that is good enough. But it was interesting to me that Mendoza, on, McGill, on the way out of this interview, a little, little presser he gave, a little dig to McGill. He said, this was Sanga's spot. He didn't really earn one of the five spots. He kind of got the mm. spot that opened up. 
which also plays into the Christian Scott stuff too. If Sanga does come back, that shrinks rotation, the opportunity a little bit, but we also don't know with Sanga coming back. Everything seems really ominous every single day about it. But I thought that was a nice little dig that Mendoza had to give McGill walking out the door. I kind of, I kind of respect that a little bit too. Basically like, listen, stay, you got, if you still want to keep this spot, yeah, stay hot kid. Cause Jose Budo has been fantastic. And not that we're rooting against Tyler McGill. We love Jose Budo on this podcast. Maybe we'll get him on one day, but it's just like the idea is that there are guys behind you. Got to stay sharp, and I kind of like that. It's this is a little bit of a, a little bit of Terry Collins when he, when back in what was it? I think like 2014, 15, when he mentioned like there's plenty of guys who want to take your spot. If you don't want to be here, if you're not going to perform, we'll find someone who will. And I'm like I kind of like that for a guy who probably needs a little bit of a kick in the ass. We met Ty Lore, lovely fellow, but he's a little he's he's big trip. He said it himself. He's like I'm Ty Lore McGill. I play League of Legends at home like that's what I do like <laughs> it's also funny because when Terry Collins said that whenever it was 14 15 2016 there was really no one else to actually take those spots mess farm system was fucking absolutely abysmal. not triple a was a wasteland <laughs> a barren wasteland with 35 year olds who were never going to have a career in the major leagues TJ Rivera Ty was, Kelly was a folk hero Eric Campbell like these were the people these were the people that were competing for those spots but now it's suddenly getting hot and these guys see, they see Christian Scott, they see Mike Fassel, they're seeing how much Jose Boulos developed. They see Brandon Spro and Nolan McLean right behind them. Like, this isn't a thing anymore where Tyler McGill has three years of runway development to his early 30s, <laughs> yeah. basically, and David Peterson just to hang out and pitch because no one else here to pitch. And I, I would honestly be interested to see if Sanga didn't get hurt, which would, one, be awesome. But two, it's awesome. if who would have actually gotten this first try at SP6 if he was here? Because Budo has been amazing. He said like nine strikeouts and 10 innings, one run this spring. The stuff looks amazing. He's talked himself about, I read an article. Was it Healy? Was it Will Salmon? It was one of the Mets beat writers that Budo fast thinks that he himself got to the next level. One was a pitch design, everything mess player development is done, but two self scouting, watching himself on the mound. And literally he didn't say this exactly, but just the way he was talking about bringing more dog. And when he was up pitching nice. the major league last year, he was like, I wanted to throw as hard as I could. I wanted to use emotion. I wanted to intimidate the other hitters. Like I wanted to go up there and like earn my spot. And he's brought that to spring training, spring training debut. Jose Buda was like flexing and screaming. Like this is <laughs> someone who fucking wants a spot. And we're going to see Budo in the rotation like second week of April because Mets have 12 games in 12 days while I'm going to be gallivanting across of Europe, across Europe, which is kind of a funny, it's going to be very <laughs> different what the Mets are doing, what I'm doing. But I, I'd be interested to see who is actually winning in this race or if McGill's just getting it because he's the veteran and because they know Budo is going to come up like a week later. Yeah, I, I think it could definitely be that um, the, the veteran, give him the nod, prove to us that you can't do it kind of thing. Like we, yeah. we don't necessarily know what Budo truly is yet still even though he looks good we kind of have an idea of what tyler mcgill is going to give us it's safe and if he sucks you move on to the next guy it's really that simple but we don't we we hope we have this problem all year long i'd love yeah, to be like oh my god pitchers. we have too many good pitchers yeah and also just any guy you want move to the bullpen could figure it out trevor mcgill we saw we yeah. said it a few times in the show it's like one of the best relievers in baseball that no one knows about guys he's gonna you be said the closer <laughs> he's gonna be the closer for the brewers to start the year with devin williams on the il and he's fucking disgusting he's like everything that mcgill is but you put it into one inning so it's 99 fastball and a, just get breaking off a crazy slider and it's like oh that would be nice if you could do that but if the competition's good like pressure makes diamonds shadow rg3 it's just you gotta do shit like this if you want to make a baseball team look like I mean, like, we're gonna, I want to kind of transition a little bit to talking about just baseball for like 10 minutes, just because I love baseball and baseball started today. And we actually got to watch regular season baseball, but like, you're, they were talking about Gavin Lux a lot in the broadcast. He had a really good game today. He had the hit that wound up yeah. going through Jay Cronenworth's glove, uh, the, the weird, the weird <laughs> play of the day. Shout out to Padres for selling their souls against us in 2022 playoffs. But like, you kind of, they talked about the fact that when the Nat Pod Dodgers a few weeks ago told him, like, hey, you're not going to be shortstop anymore. You're moving back second base. Mookie's coming to shortstop. A lot of players were taking that as demotion. But he took it like, okay, so my bat is still good enough to be on this team. I'm still good enough to be on the best team in baseball. Like, let's go. Like, I now I can't let Miguel Vargas or anybody else take the second base job from me. Like, I need this job. Like, this, I want to be on the field. Like, I need to do everything I can to stay on the field. I think that is pr hopefully the culture right now is being built among this Mets pitching staff, especially. Yeah, and I mean, even on the offensive side, like there's there's a little bit of pressure right now on who's going to be getting theoretically this last spot because we know Omar Narvaez is getting one of them. We know Joey Wendell's getting one of them. We know Tyrone Taylor's getting the other. There's kind of then only one spot for about, what, like four-ish or five guys in terms of, or maybe two spots, I guess, for yeah. four or five guys. That being Vientos, who I, I think is making the team. I've got a gut so, feeling yeah. that I think he's just going to make it as spring. And part of that is because G. Manchoy, Luke Voigt, and DJ Stewart have looked about as bad as you possibly can. Uh, not really hitting the ball hard. 
not really taking good at bats, just kind of looking a little bit overmatched. Um, and that was the exact opposite of what we saw from DJ Stewart last spring too. So is this something that the maybe a DJ Stewart got figured out a little bit after you saw a couple hundred at bats of him at the major league level? Um, is is the pressure making them crumble? It's who's now going to take this last spot? And I I truthfully don't know. I have no clue. It Jose Iglesias. I was thinking that too. Like the Mets right now, Stewart, Choi. And Void, none of them have a batting average above 200. And this is not a batting average podcast, but you need to get a few hits in spring training if you're trying to make the team, I think, to make it. Like, these guys are a situation yeah. where you probably want to see results to do it. So, I mean, why not just go uber defense if none of these guys are proving it? DJ has the option anyway. And it was also ironic that last season, yes. DJ had such a good spring, and then he went saying. down for months, and then he kind of comes up and he actually hits this year. Now it's a bad spring, but he has the option. It's probably going to get used. I think he's going to get sent down just because he gives nothing on defense anyway. So we probably, I mean, and Tyrone Taylor has been awesome. Trace Thompson went down the last round of cuts too, who was really hot to start spring. And I think they're going to keep him and hopefully keep him around for outfield depth. But why, uh, Zach Short and Jose Iglesias are both hitting right now. Like give one of them the spots yeah. to get a little more infield flexibility. Jeff can mix it in the outfield. We know that. Just let's go defense, 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 pitching because. Otherwise, like not who, who I don't I don't really want any of these guys on the roster the way they're hitting. No, uh, like we talked about, the pitchers are kind of making it tough to figure out who it is. The hitters are doing it on the exact opposite of nobody is really stepping up, and that's why I think Vientos has just given the spot because out of that group of guys, I think he's clearly been the best, and it's not that he's been yeah incredible by any means. Like him and Brett Beatty have had their struggles this spring, but they've been better than those guys. They've been players that deserve to make this roster out of opening day, and yeah, that Jose Iglesias thing that you brought up as well i i agree because you mentioned jeff mcneil can play the outfield so you don't even really need that kind of depth with big quotation marks that dj stewart could give you as an outfielder even though we're not that comfortable with him out there no not really it doesn't seem like the mets or davis stern are either but again in the spring training game today he still hit third because i think he didn't want to give him the at-bats like prove it prove it prove it get a shot get a shot get a shot and just he's not He's not there. He took a walk today, which was nice, but he's been striking out a lot. I think G-Man Troy had three strikeouts and made three or four at-bats today. It's just... He looks I'm, dead. Yeah, so Luke Voigt also looks horrific. You guys imagine the guy who wore a sleeveless jersey at Syracuse last year is not good in Major League Baseball player. I literally can't <laughs> believe it, but I don't know. This last roster spot, I even think this like might be a, a half of a hot take that the Mets might... I don't think it's going to be J.D. Martinez. I'm sure it's not going to be J.D. Martinez. I mean, maybe like 5%, 10% chance, but I could see the Mets being a little bit active on the... um on like the waiver market, the cut market of spring training ends mm. for guys without options, guys on teams, with a lot of bats teams like the Cardinals teams, like the Dodgers teams, like the Rays. who a guy like Harold Ramirez probably get, he could get cut loose. Like that's a guy like just thinking about these fringy roster type players who might not have a defensive home, but they're much better DH options than what the Mets are looking at with spring training right now. Cause guys are always going to cut loose shit like this always happens. I think this is originally how, um, I believe Garcia was picked up a couple years and years yes. ago by the Rangers, uh, an end of end of spring roster cut by the Cardinals. So there is going to be talent on the board, players you can develop. And I think the Mets now have the flexibility to add someone like that. Yeah, no, I, I will. We'll pick up there. Luke Voigt's and G man choice and whoever. It's mean, just hopefully yeah, they're playing a little bit better this spring. Um, and I think if, again, if they didn't have, if they didn't send down Trace Thompson already, uh, I would have picked him. Honestly, he had a great yeah. spring. Great. And I think he just, he's just um, extraneous with, with Tyron Taylor and Tyron Taylor is like a better version. You know what this so might as well do it. The team would have really loved Ronnie Mauricio to be healthy right now. <laughs> would have been fucking perfect last player in this roster. That's the part that's so yeah. annoying too. He's just getting reps in the DR and tears ACL and nonsense play. But one good thing. Cool. We wrap up Mets talk here. Brett Beatty has actually been hot. Like something is might really be yep. happening here. He's been pulling the ball. It's still on the ground a little bit, but at least it's being pulled. But since the beginning of March, three weeks of games, 31 plate appearances, 310, 393, 517 slash, two homers, only three walks and four strikeouts. Strikeouts were an issue for Beatty last year, which is cool. And he's been playing good defense. He's been playing back and on the line a little bit. Like it seems like all of baseball, the entire game together, is something that could, could come together for Brett Beatty at once. And four balls in play of at least 105 miles an hour, leading the team. Yeah, and we heard from our friend of the podcast, Matt Eddy, that Beatty is a slow starter. It takes him a while to get going. And as we know, his spring started off a little bit slow. Now he's kind of getting into the rhythm of things. Hopefully that leads into getting into a rhythm during the regular season because, boy, oh boy, if we could fix that black hole at third base offensively, that does change how this team feels at the plate. I want to shout out Matt too for a second. I was DMing him today. We're in a we're in a dynasty league together. Shout out the Devils Rejects, and he 
did not keep Christian Scott in favor of keeping Brian De La Cruz because wow. he wanted it's a twenty team league, it's a very deep league, so we wanted some major league, some guaranteed major league plate appearances. But I, I had the second, my, my team was tanking. We're just we're in a big rebuild, so I, I snatched Christian Scott up with the second overall pick, and the second he dropped him, I was like, I know you're going to take him. I was like, you're right, and I took him. He was like, I knew you're going to take him today. He was like, I'm so mad I dropped him. I was like, yep, yeah, yeah, I should be. So shout out Matt, but yeah, so you lose about Matt. that today. He looks so good, Christian yeah, Scott looks then, fucking good. National media was talking so about so fucking good, fucking awesome, so good. I mean. Like for a Met, Mets prospects just don't pitch this deep into spring either. Normally, how many guys even across baseball are not going to start the year at the major league level and get to actually start a game for four innings on March 20th. And he got the 60 pitches. Like that's someone who's ready to start like that. He's stretched out. He's ready yep. to go. Like, I think they're probably looking at this guy. Like how the fuck can he not? How can he not? Does David Stearns historically like, can we go Brings back and look at some slow. Brewers teams? Brings him. Yeah, on I know he's a slow guy, but slow. is that is that even with pitching too? Yes. Woodruff, Burns, Damn, Peralta all was... started their careers in the bullpen. <sighs> yeah, Woodruff. Oh my God. Yeah, because Woodruff was the 2018 playoff run, right where they went yes. to the NLCS and were like so close to beating the Dodgers. Yep. And Woodruff started the year in the bullpen, Skins. became a starter by the end. God damn it. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, he's smart. It's a fucking shame how smart he is. But that's God, that, that is pro- Oh. We got we got to talk about that amazing Reddit post about David Stearns. Oh yeah, we should talk about. It. I'll pull it up right now. It was also the fu- oh my god, this is amazing. It, the funniest thing too was that this wasn't even in the Mets actual subreddit. This was in there's there's two Mets subreddits. There's New York Mets, which is the big one, it has like a hundred thousand people in it, and then there's one that's just Mets. That's like twenty thousand, and it's definitely where more of the creatures lie. That's where we get we get a lot more hate in this subreddit than the than the bigger New nice. York Mets subreddit. People hate us in this one. Jeff but McNeil I got, hit when I tweeted out how Jeff McNeil hitting fourth was perfect, and all the people in my replies being like, "Perfect, are you like what are you smoking?" I'm like, "Fucking that good shit, man," because that's what you want. You want <laughs> Jeff McNeil hitting fourth. All right, where is it? Did it get taken down? God, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I mean, we could just pull up the tweet as well. From I got it. I, I want I want that dude's got I, the I, meters. I wanted the real post because the post had some comments that didn't make it on Twitter that were fucking unbelievable. So this is honestly, I, I would even be down. We, we need to like do some segments. We got to have some more fun with this. We kind of forgot what it was like to have fun in this podcast because we weren't allowed true, to have fun true. last year. So we're trying to think about more ways to have fun again. So maybe like Mets subreddit post of the week would be funny. I want to shout yeah. out my, my boy, Rob, uh, Scotch Plains guy. He's deep in the, Met, the real Mets subreddit. He's He holds our water a lot in there. He's a great guy. But <laughs> on the Mets subreddit, Anyone else concerned David Stearns didn't actually grow up a Mets fan? That's the title. He was asked his favorite player growing up after his press conference and couldn't give an answer. He said he sneaked, good grammar, into Shea as a teenager. With my math, that means early 2000s. Great math. All of this information is publicly available. His birthday and whatnot. (laughs) Guys, David's lying. Security would never let that happen. Even then, I think. I think we have an issue here. It's very possible he's not passionate about the Mets. He went to Harvard. That's the Boston area. New York's biggest rival town. Boston's one of them. It's very possible the culture there and the professors played mind games on him as a young man (laughs) and made him resent the Mets. I'm getting a stomach ache just thinking about this. And why is he always Uh, smiling when bad things happen to the Mets? I think he's just here to sabotage and torture us. So shout out to Happy Explorer 6606 because this is... (laughs) This is the fucking galaxy brain take of the week. And again, the comments are amazing. Reddit's the best. I spent a lot of time on Reddit. Shit's hilarious. The first comment was to Charlie Kelly clip in the in the mail room where he has all the things and he's oh, pointing yeah. and he's freaking out. Yep. And then the next one, the most upvoted I'm comment. Like <laughs> I'm not joking. I think you should seek professional mental health treatment. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. Is this is this a serious post or is this bait? What do you think? I think there's there is a weird constituency of Mets fans that are so deep in the weeds on fucking everything that I actually think that it's like seventy thirty it's real because there's I think there are a lot of Mets fans who secretly do hate David Stearns truthfully because they think Ivy League killing the game analytics fake fan all that shit. He fired Buck Showalter, the greatest manager to ever put on the Origin Blue. So you know that's that's why you got to hate. He has no respect for Buck, despite Buck deserving no respect. He got rid of him. That was his problem. I just the the line that got me. Two lines where he went to Harvard. That's the Boston area, New York's biggest rival town. Yeah, shouldn't have gone to maybe the best school in the entire country. It's New York's rival town, city, by the way, not even yeah. a fucking town. And then yeah. two, it's very possible the culture there and professors played mind games on him as a young man and made him resent the Mets. Why would they not make him hate the Yankees if it's Boston? Why would he hate the Mets? It does, there's the, again, this is the Pepe Silvia meme all over the place. These lines aren't connecting at all, but God damn it, this is an amazing post. 
And also, could you imagine the long con from David Stearns if he had spent 10 years <sighs> grueling up through the ranks of baseball, Major League Office, Houston Astros, finally got his big break with the Brewers, then to finally have re- connection and relationship with Steve Cohen for about two years under the radar. Everybody forgets to talk about Bob Nightingale and Buster Olney were talking about David Stearns to the Mets in early 22, <laughs> late 21, which really got swept under the rug. Incredible fucking tampering by our guy, Uncle Steve. And That's then so for, this, for this to come through, it'd be like, now I'm ready to destroy the Mets. That that, it, that kind of discipline, that kind of work ethic for 10 straight years working only towards destroying the Mets, who most oftentimes do a very okay job destroying themselves. Like it yeah. would be fucking impressive if that was that was actually David Stearns' way there. But this is that was fucking amazing. Good good on you for remembering that. If David Stearns did that long play, honestly, president of the United States, like he's got the, the biggest God brain damn. of all time. If this was his move, I'd respect him more than anybody. He should be leading wars. He should be making the the biggest decisions that this country could ever make because my god if they if he was doing this for for decades trying to just sabotage the team like you said that does it to themselves i mean you got to respect that level of hate i can't even get there no no get there no one can even imagine getting there so i mean maybe we should reach out to this person see we we'll see if they can come on the podcast because i'm sure the happy explorer 6606 has a lot of stuff to say oh wow oh no this okay i'm, I'm going through his profile right now so he either is one of the greatest satirical artists of our generation, or he is so deep in these weeds and is so serious because it's all it's all stuff talking about Salicata. It's all WFAN subreddit. Why Sal <laughs> so nasty to his callers? Uh, why, I'm very concerned about the afternoon show during baseball season because Tiki didn't seem to care or pretend to know what baseball is. As soon as Sal said he no, liked this, the is, this is serious. No, this is this guy's all in. He's okay, serious, or, or, he's, or it could be pure satire, but it'd be it'd be really deep on the satire, but. It's so cool when like this kind of shit like this, like because these creature Mets fans like make it to national media because we are sickos. We're the best. Like we're disgusting. It's it's amazing. What do you think he thinks about the vaccine? This guy, <laughs> I can't like it. <laughs> Cannot like the vaccine. Lot, <laughs> lots of questionable science in that vaccine from Happy Explorer six six zero six. I don't even want to scroll too far. Maybe past we'll be able to find out. It. Yeah, because yeah, it's all New York sports takes. Once you get past New York sports takes, I'm sure it's a lot of um. I don't even know. It's a lot of like furries porn and vaccine truth and truth is. <laughs> Well, guys, uh, that was a fun episode. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching whatever you are doing it on. Make sure you follow us on our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the Mets Up Podcast YouTube channel if you want to see the video version of this. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. Again, uh, if we get any reviews from you guys that are positive, I don't know, even if they're negative, we'll still read them out. Oh. We're better. We're, hand up. We always, we're always here looking for criticism, trying to get better. So if you have something that you think we should improve, tell us. We're happy to hear it. Also, if you if you rate us five stars, like we'll say anything you guys read, anything. We have we have no we have no corporate <laughs> overlords anymore. Well, say anything. not anything. Well, no, but. not anything. Nothing bad. Nothing defamatory to us that you can clip. But like, if you guys want to just talk massive shit about us, like we will read it out loud if you give us a five star review. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, drop us a review. We really do appreciate it. Follow James on Twitter at James underscore Shiano. And me at Giraffe Nick Mark. He had one more thing before I close it out. Before we close it out, we're, I want to do like some kind of fan engagement shit this year. I, I, went, I went deep in the weeds on fan tracks. Like the, it's a cool, like customizable fantasy site. And I want to do a home run, home run derby pool with Mets fans listeners. There's going to be 200 spots in the league, so 198 plus Mark and I, where it's going to be a rotisserie league technically, but there's only one stat being tracked, and that's home runs. And you're going to be able, every, anyone's going to be able to sit, get any 10 players they want in the whole league. Might make some more rules once we start drumming some engagement. But look out on Twitter this weekend or early next week. We're going to start going for that and just see how many people we can fill it up with. And we're going to have a prize at the end of the year for who is the Mets Stub Home Run Derby King. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for listening and watching. We'll catch you on the next episode. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.